Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about some advanced topics in linear algebra. And now in today's part 9, I want to talk more about the so-called change of basis. More concretely, we will look at a common example. However, as always, before we start, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And moreover, as a reward, you find a lot of additional material for all the videos with the link in the description. So if you are interested in learning mathematics, please have a look. Okay, then let's immediately start with the topic of today by recalling the so-called change of basis matrix. We also know it has some other names like transformation matrix or transition matrix. However, the important fact is it's a square matrix that transforms vectors given in the basis C into vectors given in the basis B. Hence, a column vector that comes in here from the right hand side should be interpreted as a vector represented with respect to the basis C. And then the column vector that comes out is represented with respect to the basis B. So please recall, they are just the images with respect to the basis isomorphisms. So usually we say they represent the same vector v in our abstract vector space, however with respect to different chosen bases. So now we know, if the abstract vector space v has dimension n, then this change of basis matrix is an n times n matrix. Moreover, we also know it's an invertible matrix. Of course, this makes sense, because we should be able to translate back again. Ok, and now in this video, we will look at a very concrete example for such a change of basis matrix. Indeed, it's a very common one and you can always use it if you want to change the basis in Rn. This means, in our picture here, the abstract vector space V is now given by R2. And at this point, you might argue, it's not needed to have this abstract picture here, because the vector space is already given by the very concrete one R2. However, the basis isomorphisms are still helpful to understand what is happening here. This means if we have two bases given, we can still translate them to R2 again. Hence, we land in R2 again, but now with the canonical basis. And as always, the corresponding basis isomorphisms are denoted by phi b and phi c respectively. Ok, now let's look at a very concrete example. Let's say b is given by two vectors, namely 1, 2 and 3, 4. And on the other hand, we also define c by two vectors. And here we choose 1, 0, 2, 2. The first thing you should note is that both are bases in R2. And maybe you chose basis B because it's helpful to solve a particular problem, but then you have to solve another problem and then it turns out that the basis C is beneficial. Therefore, the only thing you need is the change of basis matrix here on the lower level. With this matrix T, you can do all the translations between both sides. However, now in order to calculate this matrix, it's helpful to introduce a third basis as well. The reason for this is that we already have a very nice basis in R2. Namely, we have the canonical basis, the standard basis and I will denote this with a curved E. Now as a reminder, E is just given by 1, 0, 0, 1. So you know, this is exactly the basis we want to have here on the lower level. Therefore, our basis isomorphism in this case does not change anything. So phi E is simply given by the identity map. And exactly this fact implies that we have two very simple transformation matrices here. And please note, the first one here sends B to E and the second one here sends E to C. And in addition, the composition of both matrices here is exactly our TCB. And exactly with this matrix product, we want to calculate this transformation matrix. Ok, then I would say, let's write down what we already know. Namely, we already know the matrix TEB. Because it reads that the basis B 
is to be expressed in the standard basis. Indeed, if you look at the basis B, you see the vectors are already given with respect to our standard basis. More precisely and by definition, TEB is given by phi E of B1 in the first column and phi E of B2 in the second column. However, please don't forget, phi E is just the identity map. In other words, we have a matrix here with B1 and B2 in the columns. Hence, we can just take the basis vectors as column vectors and put them into a 2 times 2 matrix. So for our example here, it means we have 1, 2, 3, 4. In other words, by writing down the basis B like this, we already know we have this change of basis matrix. And in the same way, we also have this for the basis C represented in the canonical basis as well. So this is exactly the inverse of the matrix we actually need in the end. However, this is also something we should already write down. So let's write down TEC and now with the basis vectors of C, which as you might recall, were given as 1, 0, 2, 2. Okay, and with that you see we have all the information we need to actually calculate the matrix we want. And now I want to show you the most efficient way to do it. Indeed, it's simply a composition where we have one inverse involved. However, first you should see that the change of basis matrices nicely fit together with their indices. For example here, if B goes in from the right hand side, it also has to go in from the right here on the other side. And moreover, if the basis C comes out on the left here, it also has to come out here. So whenever you want to put in a third matrix in the middle, you just have a matrix product where E is also in the middle here. However, now for our calculation, we see that this matrix here is the inverse of a matrix we already know. Hence, we just have to calculate the inverse here and multiply the result with this matrix TEB. Now, of course, in this particular example here, it's no problem at all to calculate the inverse of this 2 times 2 matrix. However, in higher dimensions, an inverse can make a lot of problems because calculating it is a lot of work. And actually, we don't need to know the inverse because we just need to know this product here. Therefore, the efficient way is to calculate this product in one go. Indeed, you might already know how to do that because it's just a Gaussian elimination. However, for the sake of completeness, I want to show you how to do it. Now, the first thing you should note here is that in order to calculate this product, we need to solve an equation. In fact, the solution of this matrix equation should be exactly this transformation matrix here. And maybe let's call this solution we want simply x. And now if we bring this matrix here to the left hand side, we simply have TEC times x is equal to TEB. So exactly this is the matrix equation we want to solve. And now the important thing to note is that this is simply a system of linear equations. More precisely, these are more systems packed together because we have more right hand sides. In this case here you see we have exactly two right hand sides because we have two column vectors. But we can simply do the Gaussian elimination for all right hand sides simultaneously. And indeed this immediately saves a lot of work. Ok, now let's write down what we have to solve. We have 1, 0, 2, 2 on the left hand side and 1, 2, 3, 4 on the right hand side. Ok, and now we can do the Gaussian elimination as always, which means we bring the left hand side into a row echelon form, but then we can also do the backward substitution. And indeed in this example we already have the row echelon form, so we just need to do the backward substitution. However, we want to do this inside this matrix notation. Which essentially means, in order to solve this system here, we need to generate an identity matrix on the left hand side. Because then, the components of the solution X can be read on the right hand side. 
In fact, this is what produces a nice algorithm for us. Ok, here our first step should be that we multiply the second row by one half. Because then we already have the one here in the right lower corner. And then in the next step we want to generate a zero here. Hence from the first row we subtract two times the new second row. And then we have it, we have the identity matrix here on the left hand side. And on the right hand side we find minus one, minus one here. And there we have it, the system is completely solved and with this backward substitution in this matrix notation we find all the components of the solution here. And you see, as we've expected, we find a unique solution. And this solution x is exactly our change of basis matrix. So it's exactly TCB and this answers our question from the beginning. So with this matrix now we can do the translation from the matrix B into the matrix C. Moreover you should see this whole procedure I've demonstrated here would also work for example for R5. The only thing that changes is that you have a little bit more work in solving this system here. However the whole idea is exactly the same so now you can apply it to all other examples. Ok, so now you know how to calculate a change of basis matrix. So with the next video we will go more abstract again, therefore I really hope we meet again and have a nice day, bye bye.